Hey guys, welcome to the next tutorial of ethical hacking and penetration testing via Kali Linux. So even if you knew how to go ahead and secure your Wi-Fi network and you have already done so, you probably will find all the encryption acronyms a little bit puzzling. So today you will uh, go ahead. I will go ahead and highlight the differences between encryption standards like WEP, WPA, and WPA2, and why it matters which acronym you slap on your home Wi-Fi network is more important. And later on I'll be teaching you how we could go ahead and try to bypass these securities. So uh, to start with first there are different types of securities. Recent technologies have 802.11b, 11g, most commonly used are 11v that's up to 11 mbps and 81b, 11b and 11g are uh, not that famous but they're used in very large co companies because they have extreme high speed. Uh, 802.11b uses security techniques like WEP to make the network secure but WEP is not that secure uh, as per my experience and not only my experience even if you go and check on the uh, internet they will it's very easy to go and crack the WEP encryption that's why. And finally we have the IEEE that came up to uh, 802.11x standards for wireless ethernet. So let's go ahead and take a look at the different types of authentication that we have. And the first one is WEP that's and after that we have WPA, WPA2 and 802.1x authentication but I won't be teaching you much about 802.1x because uh, normally people only go ahead and use WPA2 no matter what kind of organization they are in. So you might be wondering why does it all matter? You did what you were told to, you logged onto your router after you purchased it and plugged it in for the first time and set a password. What does it matter what the little acronym next to the security encryption standard you choose was? As it turns out, it matters a whole lot as is the case with all encryption standards. Increasing computer power and exposed vulnerabilities have rendered older standards at risk. It's your network. It's your data. And if someone hijacks your network for the illegal hi hi uh, let's say hijinks, uh, it will be the police knocking on your door. And if you have some kind of organization, then they can do use that to gain access to confidential information and then later corporate espionage. So understanding the differences between encryption protocols and implementing the most advanced one for your router can go ahead and help you uh, increase your security or upgrading it if it cannot support current generation st secure standards. So that is the difference between offering someone easy access to your home and network and setting secure. So let's start with these go four types of authentication. Since the late 1990s, um, Wi-Fi security algorithms have undergone multiple upgrades with outright depreciation of older algorithms and significant revision to upgrade newer algorithms. So if you go to look at your history of Wi-Fi security, it will serve to highlight both uh, what's out there right now and what should you should av why you should avoid the older standards such as WEP. So the I'll just go to the next. Okay, so this is what a WEP looks like, and uh, WEP that is for the full form is Wide Equivalent Privacy. WEP is most widely used Wi-Fi security algorithm in the world. Uh, that is uh, a function of age, backwards com compatibility. And uh, the fact that it appears first in encryption types, selection menus in many router control panels. WEP was ratified as a Wi-Fi security standard in the September 1999 and the first versions of WEP were not particularly strong. Even for that time, they were released because uh, United States restrictions on the export of various cryptographic technology led to manufacturers restricting the devices to only 64-bit encryption. Whereas this was a, a not a 64, this was only a 64-bit encryption. When restrictions were lifted, it was increased to 128-bit despite of the introduction of 256-bit WEP encryption. So 128-bit remains one of the most common implementation standards. Despite revisions to the algorithms and increased uh, key size in the WEP, over time numerous security flaws were discovered in the WEP standard as computing power increased it became very easier and easier to exploit them. As early there was some exploits that were floating around by 2005 that the FBI from the United States gave public demonstration in an effort to increase the awareness of WEP's encryption. So WEP are not commonly used uh, that much these days and despite various improvements, uh, workarounds and other attempts to shore up the WEP system, it remains highly vulnerable and systems that rely on WEP should be upgraded or if security upgrades are not an option, replaced. The Wi-Fi Alliance officially retired WEP in 2004. So I'll just go ahead and explain you the process as to how WEP encryption looks works like. 
WAP encryption is specified by IEEE 802.11 for encryption and authentication. So this means that the standard describes WEP as having two main parts. The first being the authentication part for uh, that authentication part and the second being the encryption part. The goals of WEP are access control achieved by preventing unauthorized user for ga from gaining access because they do not have the correct WEP key. Privacy is obtained by using the WEP key to encrypt the wireless LAN data streams and only those with the correct WEP can decrypt them. So this figure will show you an uh, idea of, as to how exactly WEP encryption works like. The encryption process used by uh, the WEP is uh, uh, Rivest Cipher 4 that's called as RC4. This is also an integrity algorithm CRC32 which is used uh, on the plain text to create the integrity check value that's ICV which is used to protect them from tampering or unauthorized data modification and this figure will show you exactly what uh, de decryption of algorithm looks like. So yeah that's how it works. So now coming back to our next part would be the WPA encryption which is the full form is Wi-Fi protected access and you all must have already guessed WPA2 that's Wi-Fi protected access 2. WPA access was the Wi-Fi alliance's direct response and replacement to the increased vulnerabilities of WEP standard. It was formally adopted in 2003 I can say a year before WEP was officially retired. The most common wireless protocol, wireless protected access configuration was is the WPA PS key, that is the pre-shared key. The keys used by WPA are 256-bit, uh, a significant increase over the 64 and 128-bit keys used in the WEP system. And some of the significant changes implemented with WPA included message integrity to determine if the attacker had captured or altered packets passed between the access point and the client and the temporal key integrity protocol that's TKIP. TKIP employs a per packet key system that was uh, radically uh, more secure and fixed I can say than that was used in uh, WEP system. TKIP was later superseded by AES that's advanced encryption protocol which is used nowadays. So despite what a significant improvement okay just let me go back okay so despite what they say about the improvement done over uh, WPA over WEP, the ghost of WEP still haunted WPA. That's TKIP which is a core component of WPA was designed to be easily rolled out via firmware upgrades onto system existing uh, with WEP enabled devices. So as such it had to recycle certain elements used in the WEP system which ultimately were exploited. Again it again became uh, some kind of backdoor for hackers to go ahead and gain access into that. So WPA like its predecessor WEP it has been shown via both proof of concept and public demonstration to be very vulnerable uh, to intrusion. Interestingly the process by which WPA is usually breached is not a direct attack on WPA algorithm but by attacks on a simply better system that was rolled out with WPA and uh, Wi-Fi protected access that's WPS which was designed to make it easy to link devices to modern access points. And to be more precise if I tell you how it works WPA that's Wi-Fi protected access it is a subset of 802.11i security protocol and it was used to uh, improve encryption and authentication capabilities to the IE uh, wired uh, equivalent privacy that's the WEP protocol. The 802.11 workgroup has been developing a security standard that's 802.11i. The decision was made to take uh, the stable parts of the upcoming 802.11i standard and implement them into a standard that would provide wireless security until the 802.11i standard was finalized. So the standard takes these six elements of the 802.11i protocol and puts them together to increase the security provided by WEP. And finally we have the WPA2 which is quite different and the most secured till date but I won't say that it's that secure because still uh, if, even though if it, uh, no matter how secure it is it is still crackable but not as much as the WP, uh, e or WPA or WPA, uh, WEP. So WPA that is wireless protected access to. So it was started in 2006 and it was officially superseded by WPA2. 
One of the most significant changes between WPA and WPA2 was the mandatory use of AES algorithms and uh, the introduction of CCMP that is counter cipher mode with a block uh, chaining uh, message authentication code protocol. Uh, I believe that's what the full form is. So it was a replacement for TKIP which was still preserved in WPA as a fallback system and for interop interoperability with WPA. So currently the primary uh, security vulnerability uh, to the actual WPA2 system is the obscure one and it requires the attacker to already have access to the secured Wi-Fi network in order to gain access to certain keys and then perpetuate an attack against other devices in the network. So as such, security implementations on uh, the known WPA vulnerabilities are limited almost entirely to enterprise level networks and deserve like no practical consideration uh, regard to home network security. But unfortunately, the same vulnerability that is the biggest hole into the WPA armor, the attack vector through Wi-Fi protected setup that's WPS remains in the modern WPA2 capable access points. Although breaking into the WPA or WPA2 secured network using this vulnerability requires uh, like a total of 2 to 14 hours of sustained effort with a modern computer. It is still a legitimate security concern and WPS should be disabled and if possible the firmware of the access point should be flashed to a distribution that doesn't even support WPS or so the attack vector is entirely removed. So Wi-Fi security history now you know what it's like. So now what? At this point you will be either feeling a little smug because you are confidently using the best encryption scheme available for your Wi-Fi access point. Or you're a little nervous because you packed uh, the in the WEP since it was at the top of your list. If you're on the later, you don't have to worry. But if you have used WEP, you never know. Someone might already have gained your access. So before we I uh, hit you with a further reading of our top list of Wi-Fi security uh, tutorial, this is a basic list ranking with uh, current Wi-Fi security. The first one. Uh, the, uh, and the best one would to go ahead and keep your network secure would be to use WPA2 plus AES encryption. After that WPA plus AES, after that WPA plus TKIP or, T or AES again because uh, TKIP will be the fallback method or WEP or no network security at all which I think would be the worst. So ideally you can go ahead and disable Wi-Fi protected access that uh, so Wi-Fi protected setup that's WPS and set your router to WPA2 plus AES. So everything on that list is a less than ideal step down from that. Once you get to WEP, your security level is so low it's about as effective as a chain link fence. The fence exists simply to say, hey this is my property and no one should enter. But anyone who actually wanted in would just climb right over it. And finally I will have to teach you about the 802.1x. So, but before I proceed with that, let me explain you something about the WPA2. Uh, there are two forms of WPA. One is WPA PSK and WPA2 PSK. So, uh, the Wi-Fi protected access, that's WPA and the new WPA2. PSK can either be used for both of the encryption method. WPA or WPA2 Enterprise provides coverage for large entities, uh, but it requires a radius server. WPA Personal, that's WPA2 PSK, is an appropriate use for residential and home business settings. So you might be wondering that uh, uh, how does WPA PSK or WPA2 PSK work? With WPA PSK, that's um, Personal Security Key, you can configure each wireless LAN node, access point, wireless routers, client adapters, bridges, not with an encryption key, but with a rather plain English passphrase uh, that contains up to 133 characters and using the technology called as TKIP that's temporary key integration uh, integrity protocol that paraphrase along with the network SSID is used to generate unique encryption keys for um, each wireless network. So these encryption keys are constantly changed when clients connect the WPA PSK authentication users provide the password to the uh, verify whether to allow them access to the network or not and as long as the passwords match a client is granted access to the wireless LAN. So you might be wondering that when sh uh, should I go ahead and use the PSK authentication. PSK was designed for home and small network office that do not require the complexity of 802.1x authentication server. Some reasons to use PSK authentication are PSK simply is very simple to implement as opposed to 
802.1x, 802.1x authentication which requires a radius server but your legacy clients might not support 802.1x or the latest WPS standard. Then you might wonder uh, why would I not use the uh, WP, uh, the PSK authentication. Even if you have a small company, there are drawbacks to using PSK authentication. For example, if an administrator leaves the company, you should reset the PSK key. This can become quite tiresome and it will be skipped obviously because you will not go ahead and uh, actually go ahead and uh, uh, change the keys every day because you will be actually get you will actually get fed up one or the later point of time and uh, because you need to go ahead and reconfigure let me give an example uh, you are here to go ahead and learn this tutorial today about wireless hacking but you might be wondering that okay this is just you can say this powerpoint presentation that i'm teaching you right now and you don't actually have anything to learn like actual hacking but the thing is in order for you to know how exactly wireless hacking works you need to know what are the encryption and decryption protocols are and how exactly they work else you will be similar to the administrator who just goes ahead and keeps his password as abcd at the rate one two three thinking that he has a total of eight characters which are different and he will probably keep a as capital and d as capital and he will think that he has a good security because he has capital letters small case let lowercase letters and different characters and numerics as well but no that is one of the most easiest to crack Similarly, just going ahead and cracking uh, cracking a Wi-Fi is not. So if sometime later on, if someone gains access to your Wi-Fi, you will know that he's not a noob because people who are new to hacking cannot go ahead and crack a Wi-Fi or no, no, not as even a single noob can go ahead and crack a Wi-Fi password, especially WPA or WPA2 because it requires intense knowledge about how the encryption and decryption protocols works. So. Uh, uh, coming back to our point, if an administrator leaves the company, you should reset the PSK key and this uh, may be skipped by a lot of administrators. If one user is compromised, even if one, then all the users can be hacked. PSK cannot perform machine authentication the way that IEEE 802.1x authentic can authentication them. Keys tend to become old because they are not dynamically created for users upon login, nor are the keys rotated frequently. You must remember to change the keys and create keys long enough to be a challenge to hackers or to be much irritable for pe uh, people to go ahead and change them every now and then. So if you want me to be more precise, a proper way of creating a key is something like would be typing A eight G H I P zero. No, not this won't suffice. So this doesn't make any sense, right? Yes, that's why. And this should be how your password should look like some and any random set of numbers but you should make sure that you don't have any kind of specific word that can make sense because if that does then it will make 99% uh, more sense to the computer and it will be able to crack your password so to be uh, more precise this is how your password should look like <laughs> and this uh, not I don't think that this uh, people can go and crack these kinds of password but still there's another way that is called a social engineering which you already know and um, PSK is subject to brute force uh, key space search attacks and dictionary attacks. And one more thing uh, you can do is let's say for example you just go ahead and type random passwords like this and uh, this is just an example. And one more thing instead of just keeping these you can also go ahead and type a space. Yes space also tends to be a password. And uh, normally people go ahead and keep the space at the start or at the in between but no one actually go, goes ahead and thinks of space in the end. You can have multiple spaces in the end and you can type something like not ASD because it's quite uh, easy to understand so this and if you have this password in WPA2 I can guarantee you with anything that no one will be able to crack except until it is social engineering. Even I think you won't be able to uh, remember this password yourself no matter how much times you would not actually try to remember them. Just a quote. So WPA2 uh, PSK uses a more advanced encryption type. Additional processing power is required to keep the network functioning at full speed. And wireless networks that use legacy hardware for access point and routers can suffer speed reductions when using WPA2 personal instead of WPA2 instead of WPA. Sorry. And especially when several users are connected or a large amount of data is moving through the network, because WPA2 personal or PSK is a new standard. Firmware upgrades can also be required for some hardware. Uh, normally you won't be requiring that but still uh, it is much better than WPA exclusively. How is uh, WPA encryption different from WPA PSK you might be wondering. The primary difference between WPA and WPA2 PSK are the encryption ciphers used to 
security network. WPA can use only the encryption cipher that's TKIP, whereas WPA2 PSK can use TKIP. But because TKIP security keys are, are less secure, WPA2 uh, protocol usually uses the AES encryption method. And AES uses a much more advanced encryption algorithm that cannot be defeated by tools that overcome the TKIP security and making it a much more secure encryption method. Hey guys, welcome to the next tutorial of ethical hacking and penetration testing via Kali Linux. So before I go ahead and teach you actually how we can actually go ahead and hack into something, I like to teach you about one final thing before that and that is 802.1x. Understanding what the IEEE uh, 802.1x standard is and why uh, you should care means understanding three different concepts which I will be teaching you today that is PPP, EAP and 802.1x itself. So understanding what IEEE 802.1x understand I'll go and teach you exactly what that means today. So most people are familiar with PPP that's point to point protocol. PPP is or I'll call it as PQ as of now because that's quite easy uh, than type uh, than going ahead and spelling it out as PPP or pronouncing it PPP whatever. So PPP is most commonly used or PQ is most commonly used for dial up internet access. PQ is also used uh, by some ISP for DSL and cable modem authentication in form of PQ over, over Ethernet. So PQ is a part of layer 2 tunneling protocol that is a core part of Microsoft's secure remote access solution for Windows 2000 and after that. PQ evolved beyond its original use as a dial-up access method and is now used all over the internet. One piece of PQ defines an authentication mechanism with dial-up internet access that the username and password you're using. PQ authentication is used to identify the user at the other end of the PQ line before giving them access. Most enterprises want to do more for security than simply employing username and passwords for access. So a new authentication protocol called the extensible uh, authentication protocol that's EAP it was designed. EAP sits inside the PPP's authentication protocol and provides a generalized framework for several different authentication methods. EAP is supposed to head off proprietary authentication systems and let everything from password to challenge response tokens and public key infrastructure certificates all work smoothly. So with a standardized EAP, interoperability and compatibility of authentication methods become very simpler. For example, when you dial a remote access server and use the EAP as a part of your PPP connection, the RAS doesn't need to know any, uh, any of the details about the authentication system. And only you and the authentication server have to be coordinated. By supporting EAP authentication, uh, as a RAS server uh, gets out of the business of acting as middleman, and just packets and repackages EAP packets to hand off to a radius server that will do the actual authentication. So this brings us to the IEEE 802.1x standard which is simply a standard for passing EAP over a wired or wireless LAN. Uh, with 802.1x your package EAP messages in Ethernet frames and uh, you, it does not use PPP. Its authentication uh, needs much more. That's desirable in situations in which rest of the PQ isn't needed when you're using protocols other than the TCP IP or where the overhead and the complexity of PPP is undesirable. But 802.1x uses three terms that you need to know. The user or client that wants to be authenticated is called as a supplicant, the actual server doing the authentication, typically a radius server which is called the authentication server and the device in between such as a wireless access point. It is also called as the authenticator. One of the key points of 802.1x is that authenticator can be simple and dumb and all of the brains have to be let's say in the supplicant and the authentication server similar to like computer. Your monitor is just deaf and dumb and it orders all the work that your computer does, that your CPU does. So this makes 802.1x ideal for wireless access points which are typically small and have little memory and processing power. So the protocol in 802.1x is called EAP encapsulation over LANs, that's EAPOL, EPOL. And it is currently defined for Ethernet-like LANs including 802.11 wireless as well and along with that as well as the token ring LANs such as FDDI. And EPOL is not particularly sophisticated, there are number of modes of operation but 
the most common case would look something like the authenticator sends an EAP request identifier packet to the supplicant and uh, you can say as let's say uh, as soon as it detects that the link is active it will go ahead and send the packet. The supplicant sends an EAP response identity packet to the authenticator which is then passed on to the authentication server that's radius and the authentication server sends back a challenge to the authenticator such as with a token password system. The authenticator then unpacks this from the IP that's internet protocol and repackages it into EAPOL. That's again what I told you previously that's EPOL that's encaps uh, EAP encapsulation over LAN and then it sends it back to the supplicant. So different authentication methods will vary this message and total number of messages. EAP supports client only authentication and strong mutual authentication. Only strong mutual authentication is considered appropriate for the wireless case. And yep, yeah, to be more specific in the end, if the supplicant provides proper identity, the supplicant responds to the challenge via authenticator and passes the response on to the authentication server. Uh, supplicant provides proper identity, the authentication server responds with a success message uh, which is then passed on to the supplicant. The authenticator now allows the LAN possibly restricted based uh, on the attributes that came back from the authentication server. To be uh, more specific, let's say the authenticator, authenticator might switch the uh, supplicant to a particular virtual LAN or install a set of firewall rules. So you might be wondering that how does the 802.1x help wireless security? So it's so complicated. The 13 year old wired equivalent policy that's WEP protocol, it has been discredited so thoroughly that its authentication and encryption capabilities are not considered sufficient for use in enterprise networks. In response to the WEP fiasco, many wireless LAN uh, vendors have latched onto IEEE 802.1x standard to help authenticate and secure both wireless and wired LANs. The wildcard with 802.1x protocol is interoperability. So 802.1x authentication might, uh, it helps uh, mitigate, you can say as many of the risks involved in uh, using WEP. For example, one of the biggest problems of with WEP is the long life of keys and the fact that they are shared among users and are very well known. With 802.1x, each station could have a unique WEP key for every session, the authenticator, that's w, uh, wireless access point, could also choose to change the WEP key very frequently such as even every 10 minutes or every 1000 frames. So the 802.1x does not guarantee improved security. For example, an authenticator might never change the key it hands out to its each supplement. Or the network manager might select an authentication method uh, that does not allow for distribution of WEP keys. So 802.1x does however give the informed network manager the potential to design and implement a more secure wireless LAN. So this is how it works in total. It's not always how much secure you can keep, it's more about how much you can go ahead and complicate it so that it uh, becomes more complicated for the attacker to go ahead and hack and he will simply go ahead and lose his trust in hacking and he will probably may not or leave uh, that part and tie something else. And at least your wireless security will be secure. So uh, Wi-Fi and just to be sure Wi-Fi cracking is not for beginners and playing it with it requires basic knowledge of how WPA authentication works and moderate familiarity with Kali Linux and its tool. So if any hacker at any point of time gains access to your network, he is probably no beginner because he will no one can go ahead and crack a Wi-Fi that's a WPA2 password by mistake unless until he does some kind of social engineering in which case he's again very good and again you are at loss. So that is it and that's the end for my theoretical part for the WPA and the wireless security keys. In this tutorial I'll be actually teaching you as to how we can go ahead and hack into some network using Kali Linux. Hey guys and welcome to the next tutorial of ethical hacking and penetration testing and in this tutorial I'll be teaching you exactly how we are going to go ahead and hack into our Wi-Fi network using our Kali Linux. So you can just go over here and I'll just start my operating system. And there is a sad news that I won't be actually show it to you as to how we can go ahead and crack into that but I will teach you. The reason being that if you're using VMware like me 
you too probably won't be able to hack into Kali Linux, uh, hack into your Wi-Fi network. The reason being that uh, Kali Linux does not support Wi-Fi cracking via VMware or through any kind of sub-subsidiary operating system software. If you want to go ahead and crack, you'll actually have to go ahead and install it uh, manually on the hardware and then run it uh, separately rather than going ahead and running it under Windows. Uh, because uh, when running over it like this, uh, the Cal Linux needs to put your Wi-Fi into a wireless um, monitor mode, which in which it needs to scan the computers, which cannot be done when uh, you are accessing Windows as well. So I will only be able to teach you exactly how that works and I'll show you the tools even though if uh, it's not I'm not able to run that in my system but I will teach you the proper way. So let's fire up our Cal Linux. So a few things that you would need today would be a successful installed Cal Linux version and be a wireless adapter that is capable of injection or monitor mode and a word list to try and crack the handshake password once it has been captured. So two things uh, most important that would necessary would be you time and patience. If you think that you can just go ahead and type in something and crack the Wi-Fi password like you could do for something else, you're wrong. Uh, Wi-Fi cracking, e even if it's simple and WPA2, it takes like hours of cracking to actually go ahead and crack into something. Minimum of like 4 hours, 5 hours, sometimes even days, like 3 or 4 days. So wi -Fi, that's why I told you in the very beginning that Wi-Fi cracking is not for beginners. It's If someone has hacked into your Wi-Fi system, he's probably a pro. So. So now uh, one more thing that we would be needing would be a word list to go ahead and crack the handshake. So if you have all of these things, time, patience, uh, specific softwares and the hardware, just let's roll up your sleeves and let's secure our, see how secure your network is. So uh, as of now I don't have my wireless adapter. If you have it, you can go ahead and connect that to your computer. If you have Linux Calinus in uh, VMware, then you might have to connect the card via image icon in the device menu. So and after that. The next thing that you would need to do is would be to disconnect all everything from the wireless network and open a terminal and type airmon ng. So probably in my system I won't be able to teach you much the reason being that I am teaching you this on desktop and don't have a Wi-Fi installed over here but still I'll go ahead and teach you all the commands that you will need. So you can type airmon hyphen ng and hit enter and it will show you the interface. I don't have anything but for you it will show you wlan 0 and this will list all the wireless cards that support monitor mode not injection mode and if no cards are listed uh, try disconnecting and reconnect the card and check that it supports the monitor mode. We can check if the card supports monitor mode by typing ifconfig in another terminal and see if the card is listed in ifconfig but doesn't show up in Airmon ng then the card does not support it. We can see that uh, over here uh, my, I, you cannot see my card the reason being that I don't have anything installed but I'll sh still show, go, ahead, go ahead and show you the commands. So you can go and type Airmon ng uh, followed by the interface of your wireless card. So let's say for example, if you have WLAN 0, then you can go and type Airmon ng space uh, start and uh, for your case it would be WLAN 0 because that would be your wireless network. Over here we won't have anything and just ignore all of these things. Uh, it will get you no matter what you do, you will always get these errors. So after you go ahead and do this, the, this message that you will see is something like monitor message enabled over here in the end. This message means that the card has successfully been put into monitor mode. Note that the name of the new monitor uh, interface will be MON0, that's MON0, that's monitor 0. And recently a bug was discovered in Cal Linux that makes Aramon NG set the channel as fixed minus 1. So when you first enable MON0, you will see this error. And if you receive this error, do not simply take any kind of chance. You need to follow some specific steps after enabling mon0. So you can go and open your new to another terminal and type ifconfig. Over here you will not see anything but uh, in your case you will see the inter interface of your wireless cards that wlan0. So replace the interface of your wireless card with the name of the interface that you enabled mon0 on. Probably called as wlan0. This disables the wireless card from connect to in connecting to internet and allowing it to focus on monitor mode instead. And that is the reason why I won't be able to go ahead and show it to uh, you on my uh, VMware. The reason until unless I go ahead and connect something uh, or Wi-Fi. The reason being that when you're using a wi uh, inbuilt Wi-Fi in Windows, it will not allow to go itself in the monitor mode as it does in Linux. So after you have disabled Mon0, you will need to enable WLAN0. Uh, and that would be your actual wire. So you can go ahead and type ifconfig and the interface of your network card 
and, uh, and then pressing enter. After that it's done, uh, your card will be active and then you can go back to your original terminal and you can go ahead and if you re uh, you can go ahead and type arrow, sorry, arrow dump ng followed by the name of your new monitor interface which is mon0 probably by now and p would be single, sorry, yeah perfect and it would be mon0, the new network would be and uh, once you go ahead and type this uh, as of now there won't be any interface because I don't have installed so just ignore this error but as soon as you go ahead and see this you will see fixed minus one error and uh, if you see this then everything is perfectly fine the next step that we need to do would be Aerodom will now list all the wireless networks in your area and lots of uh, useful information about them locate your network or the network that you have permission to penetrate uh, into and once you have spotted your network uh, you can go ahead and stop the ever populating list by type, by hitting Control C on your keyboard to stop the process. Now note the channel of your target network. You will see some some kind of like BSID and something. Once you see this, go ahead and type arrow dump spa, uh, hyphen ng space minus C and hyphen BSSID and over here minus c means would be the channel and you will know exactly what the channel is once you go ahead and start your wi-fi interface running you will see the channel when you go ahead and hit see the bsis id uh, as i told you after typing this and after you will see the bsis id and the channel so just type uh, c in case the channel is zero you can go ahead and type zero bsis id would be any of your id that would be let's say for example uh, 10 is to ff is to e is to 12 is to 1 2 i don't know exactly what i'm writing i'm just writing random stuff but this is something how it would look like after that you can type hyphen w slash uh, sorry space slash root slash desktop slash and you can type go ahead and type monitor interface bracket and hit enter and you can go ahead and replace the channel with the channel of your target network paste the network of your BSID and replace the monitor interface over here with whatever your monitor interface is with the name of your monitor enabled interface so in your case it would be mon0 perfect so it would look something like this and don't put brackets just put something directly so a complete command would do some, something like this i'll just go ahead and make some changes so that it will be easier for you to understand this would be the channel as how it looked in my previous laptop and here it would be the mac id of your computer so it would look something like 00, 0 colon 14 colon bf colon uh, let's say e0 okay i think i typed something wrong but my num log is off i believe e0 colon e8 colon d5 <coughs> So it would look something like this and after the extra there would be a space in between and you can go ahead and hit enter over here. So once you go ahead and do this, your, uh, uh, you will actually go ahead and see what all things are actually running. So the next, the, that's it for this tutorial. In the next tutorial I'll be continuing with the, uh, it, will, it will be a continuation of this tutorial as to how we could, could actually go ahead and crack the system. So after you have went ahead and ran all of these things, Aerodum will now monitor only the target network allowing us to capture more specific information about it. So what we are really doing now is waiting for a device to connect or reconnect to the network forcing the router to send out the 4 way handshake that we need to capture in order to crack the password. Also 4 files to show up on your desktop and this is where the handshake will be saved when capture. And make sure that you don't delete them else again else you will have to go ahead and capture them again. But we are not actually going to wait for a device to connect, no. That's not what impatient hackers do and we are impatient hackers. So we are actually going to go ahead and use another cool tool that belongs to the aircrack suit that is called as Airplay NG to speed up the process. And instead of waiting uh, for a device to connect, hackers use this tool to force a device to reconnect by sending a deauthentication packet to the device making it think that it has to reconnect with the router. Of course in order for this to tool to work, there must be someone else other than you, or I know that you are not connected, but there must be someone else, at least one party uh, that must be connected to the network first. So watch the Aerodop NG and wait for a client to show up. 
it might take a long time depending upon what time of day it is and who's actually connecting it and if you're around in a corporate area then you will obviously get someone or the other or it might take only a second before the first one shows if none show up after a lengthy wait then the network might be empty row or you are very far away from the network so if you go ahead and wait then uh, I'll, I'll assume that you have uh, some client in between that has appeared on your network so we'll continue to the next step so now you need to go ahead and keep this uh, specific command running that's error dump ng and you need to open a second terminal and you need to type something like this air play ng space hyphen zero space two space hyphen a don't worry i'll be explaining this to you what exactly this is over here it would be router bssid over here hyphen c from client bssid mon zero and uh, over here hyphen zero is a shortcut for the deauthorization mode two is the number of deauthorization packets to send hyphen a indicates the access point that is the router's bssid and replace the router's bssid with the bssid of the target network so which in my case over here would be something different that would be this one that's the mac id and bsid and mac id are the same just to be clear and hyphen c would be the uh, it indicates the client's bsis id and uh, you can that you have noted in the previous picture replace the client's bsis id that means the person who has connected to the network and this will be listed under the station so over here i'll just go ahead and create some random id again it will be 00 colon 14 colon um let's say fg colon cd cd colon i don't know how exactly this works or what is the method as to how exactly this works so i'm just writing any random stuff e008 perfect i believe 66 six. okay perfect and in the end mon0 that is your uh, obviously your monitor interface change it if it's different it's uh, monitor one or two or whatever it is so this is how exactly the command line will look like upon hitting enter you will see airplay ng sending the packets and within moments you should see this uh, message appear on the error dump ng screen this means that the handshake has been captured the password is in the hacker's hand and in maybe in some form or the other but you have the password you only need thing that you need to do is to decrypt the keys so you can go and close the airplay ng terminal and hit control c on the error dump terminal over here to go ahead and stop the monitor mode and uh, but don't close it it's just in case you need some information later on i have closed it because i have no reason to keep it started because i have not even ran it so this as of now till now it concludes the part external part of our tutorial from now on the process entirely between your is you in inside your computer and the four files that on your desktop that is you'll get some four files over here in the desktop with period cap extension that is important so i'll just go ahead and delete all of these things because i have no reason to keep it as it is so open up a new terminal and type in some the following command just air crack ng space hyphen a2 space hyphen b space the routers bss id so over here i'll just type some random stuff Uh, e9 perfect and over here i'll just type hyphen w this would be the part to the word list so in our case it would be something like uh, slash root and let's say for example w and the name of my word list would be i'll just go and type word list over here whatever the name of your word list is slash desktop if i have that on the desktop okay let me check uh, okay desktop slash and whatever is the extension of your cap file that you find it over here so what it is going to do is that it's going to crack uh, the uh, mac id just use the mac id to go ahead and crack this word uh, this cap extension with our word list so hyphen a is the method error crack will use to crack the handshake uh, a2 is uh, the wpa method that's wpa2 uh, hyphen b stands for the bss id and uh, hyphen w stands for the word list replace the path a word list to with the part to your word list that you have downloaded i have the word list called as wpa that's w 
world list period txt so i'll just type something like txt if it is in my root directory and i will just type space and root a slash desktop period cap uh, asterisk period cap is the uh, part to the cap file containing the password and the asterisk means a wildcard in linux since i'm assuming that there are no other cap files on your desktop this should won't work fine uh, the way it is so this is how my complete command line would look like and just in case your word list is in some other directory what i could just i'll just type if it's on the same as desktop i can just type something like this perfect okay sorry yeah, i missed out a bit and slash perfect and i don't need p perfect so this is how it should look like in actual scenario and as soon as you hit enter Aircrack ng will now launch into a process of cracking the password however however it will only crack if the password happens to be in the word list that you have selected sometimes it not in case the password is something like azsd12911s47 some random word in case it's that it's it won't be crackable and if this is the case then you can congratulate your owner on being impenetrable of course only after you have tried every uh, word list that a hacker might use or make and cracking the password might take a long time depending on the size of the word list when i tried previously mine went very quickly and the password that i got from my when i cracked previously what a monster at that on fine and the password like m o n s t a r sorry at the rate r and it was hash 159 and if you think that this is a, a tough password it's not it was easily cracked in uh, approximately 15 minutes i believe so the passphrase to test our network was not secure and uh, uh, you can see uh, that Aircrack found it. So if you find the password without a decent struggle, then change your password. So best way to do this would be go ahead and crack your own Wi-Fi setup. And if, if you're penetrating someone else, uh, then tell them to change your password as soon as possible until unless you want them to go ahead and actually get into some kind of trouble. So that would be it for this tutorial from my end for today. And that's how we actually go ahead and crack a Wi-Fi password. And so if you are thinking right now that this is quite easy for someone to go ahead and crack that password, trust me, it is not. So next time if somebody cracks your password, make sure that uh, you will have, you will need to come to know that password cracking or actually Wi-Fi cracking instead is not a process that a noob can do. You need to be a pro. So that is it for this tutorial and the end of wireless cracking. So in the next tutorial I'll be teaching you, uh, maybe teach you about Bluetooth cracking or I'll go on to the next chapter.